seven men and five women will sit on a jury to preside over former President Donald Trump's hush money trial taking place in New York City. It is the first criminal trial of any president. News reports over the week made it sound like a three ring circus was taking place at the New York courtroom. The judge has had to issue a gag order on Trump to stop him from posting information about those involved in the trial, including jurors and the judge's family. A couple of jurors reportedly bowed out, worried about whether their identities would be revealed. President Donald Trump is sitting on trial for allegedly asking his longtime lawyer Michael Cohen to pay off former porn star Stormy Daniels to keep quiet about an alleged affair. What elevates the alleged crime from a misdemeanor to felony is that the DA claims it was done to tamp down information during the campaign and is thus on par with election interference. Trump has instead accused the prosecution of interfering with the election as he is unable to campaign and has been legally ordered to physically show up in court. All three, Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, and David Pecker of the National Enquirer and protagonists of the alleged story are expected to testify in this trial. So that's very exciting. I think a lot of people were fascinated with the voir dire process. I can't imagine getting chosen to be a juror in this case and you show up and it's Donald Trump. There was one potential juror that uh, ended up saying she couldn't be impartial in this case. She felt that she wasn't capable of it. And she told the press that he looks less orange in person, which was a funny thing to say, but she also said he looked bored, that he just wants to go back and do his stuff. He doesn't look angry and that stuff would probably be running for president in 2024. Yeah, and I mean, in addition to the time that obviously he's spending in court throughout this, he's also spending a lot of money in legal fees, which takes away from his campaign work chest. So it's understandable that he's pretty frustrated about the whole situation. Um, basically what the DA is accusing him here of is fudging the books, so to speak, by claiming that the reimbursement payments to Michael Cohen, who paid Stormy Daniels directly to allegedly keep her quiet about this supposed affair, were marked as legal expenses as opposed to campaign expenses. So they're claiming that this is a campaign finance violation. And uh, there's been some consternation from the Trump team over whether or not the statute of limitations uh, should have expired. Apparently, New York just extended the statute of limitations something like last year so that this could be brought to trial. And they also raised questions about that upgrading this from a misdemeanor to a felony. I think the most apt comparison we have in recent history is when Hillary Clinton paid for Fusion GPS to conduct opposition research on the former president, which came out of the Steele dossier. Christopher Steele, of course, being the former British spy who compiled uh, all of these uh, Russian uh, co complaints or allegations about Trump misbehaving in Moscow into the dossier that then sort of snowballed into Crossfire Hurricane, which was the FBI investigation into Russian collusion. And she similarly marked those expenses as legal fees as opposed to campaign expenses. And at the end of it all, she basically just said she was sorry, it was an accident. They said no big deal, she paid a fine, and then everyone moved on with their lives. She clearly did not have to go to court in New York City and face a criminal trial. So, I mean, to me, this seems like just the latest example of perhaps a political double standard or a judicial double standard in how Trump is treated by the system. Yeah, I think this is just highlighting how much actual campaign violations there are on your standard political campaign in the United States, uh, more so at the highest levels, right? We saw Hillary Clinton as well that same year in 2016. Well, I guess it would be earlier on the campaign trail in 2015, where, uh, you know, she was very obviously the nominee that Democratic establishment politicians, career campaign workers wanted. Uh, she was their pick. But you also had Bernie Sanders, who was extremely viable, very popular among the working class, and Hillary Clinton, ultimately, at a time when the Democratic Party was really struggling financially, decided to prop up the Democratic Party and essentially was holding the puppet strings to the Democratic Party because of this. Uh, she ended up using a lot of the money that was meant to be used in the general election, starting before she got the Democratic nomination. This was a huge scandal. You also have so many people just using petty cash during a campaign cycle for personal expenses 
And this gray area around use of money for legal expenses or public relations uh, and using the money to cover up their own questionable behavior and to pay off people like Stormy Daniels, oh, or if it's legal fees when it's really questionable investigation of your op opponent, if there's some kind of spying going on, right? Richard Nixon, we have uh, you know Watergate still being the thing that we talk about whenever there's a political scandal, everything just gets gated at the end of it. And so when are we gonna step up and say, let's make some policy regulating campaign finance reform uh, or rather regulating campaign finance, we need campaign finance reform uh, with consequences so that there's actually a deterrent factor, not just a slap on the wrist from the FEC. Let's get into the jury selection, too, because this is obviously a part of the case that has made a lot of headlines over the past week. When it started on uh, Monday or Tuesday of this week, they were trying to pick who was going to be on the jury. And this is fundamentally a very difficult thing. As you mentioned, one of the jurors was dismissed because she admitted that she could not be impartial towards the former president. And I imagine it's a difficult thing in New York City to find just about anybody who could be considered a jury of your peers that doesn't know what's going on with the former president and have some kind of strong opinion about him. He has some of the highest name ID of anyone in the in the world, let alone in the United States. And it seems like everyone has an opinion on him. There are very few people who are undecided on how they feel about Trump. And there's also been so many headlines about this case in particular. And I do wonder if, if you feel, Jessica, the way that I feel about this, which is in terms of the gag orders that have been put out, there's been interviews by people who are prosecuting the case, talking about how Trump is surely guilty. Michael Cohen has been out there giving interviews. Stormy Daniels for years has made herself sort of a media figure. But Trump is not allowed to talk about it the way that they are. And to me, that seems fundamentally unfair. If someone who's prosecuting me goes out and gives this interview I mean, with the presupposition that I'm guilty and that they're going to get me on this criminal offense, I feel like I should be able to defend myself in response and maybe in just outside of the courtroom, too, because they're basically swaying media and public opinion against him and, and essentially poisoning the jury pool. Right. Yeah, I think there would be grounds for some kind of defamation lawsuit if what they're saying is untrue in this case. Donald Trump, if what they're saying is untrue to the media, could sue them afterwards. Absolutely. And so that's kind of a personal lawsuit thing. But in terms of wanting a jury to be impartial in a criminal case, you're going to want them to not be swayed by interviews in the media. So people that are destined to testify in this case and people who are prosecuting attorneys or defense attorneys on this case shouldn't be able to talk to the media either. If you don't want to sway how the jury decides on the case with a huge public figure, maybe the biggest public figure, um, you've got Donald Trump being, you know, in court with them. They're going to recognize his face as well, even if they don't know his name. And so it's a crazy situation where how can you have a jury be an impartial with a public figure as big as this? Plus, if you have their family members, perhaps they're scrolling and you have an interview with Michael Cohen pop up, it is going to influence your ultimate decision in the case. How could it not? You're a human being. You can say you're doing your best to be impartial. But if you see these arguments outside of the courtroom, it is going to sway your judgment to some degree. So this, I think, should have been a case where if we wanted to demonstrate what a proper you know, trial would look like, we would not want the attorneys, we would not want anyone testifying in the case to be able to give media interviews either. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. All right, we'll be back, more rising after this.